why don't you kick us off and tell us really how the age differences, uh, which are true in most of the developing world, are already affecting um, our world in 2016. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation here. Yeah, journalists have a, a saying that we have a way of counting, which is one, two, trend. <laughs> which, of course, is not necessarily true, but it is what we do, uh, and we do it too often. Nevertheless, I think on some of the big issues, uh, it, it, it's true, and one of them is migration. One of them, for me, is the drift to the right, which is going to continue in <coughs> Europe. Uh, another one is, is the ageing uh, issue, which I think we're mostly all aware of. So, I'll, I mean, it's pretty basic stuff, but that's a, a basic snapshot. I mean, you look at the differences, sizes of the pyramids. I mean, you, I guess you know most of this stuff, but look at West Africa, and that is true of most of the developing world, and it's certainly true of, of the Middle East. Then you look at Western Europe, and as you go up that pyramid on the right, at some point it risks toppling over, which is why that pyramid on the left uh, will be, my left, will be moving uh, our way. That's one population projection. As you can see, we are flatlining and then declining. And as you can see, Africa is rocketing. I've got different figures to that. At the moment, it's one and a half billion in Africa. Uh, I think by 2100, <coughs> it'll be three billion. That's still a doubling in, uh, what, just 18, 80, 90 years. So what's happening? Well, the South moves north, and it's going to continue to move north. And it's the politics that, uh, of each individual nation state that's going to drive the response. Merkel had an open door policy, not out of the goodness of our heart, I'm sure she's a very nice woman, but because Germany needs replenishing far more than does Britain, for example. So the hard hearted British uh, took a hard, cold look at this and thought, our population is growing slightly, we don't need to replenish as fast. And that's the politics of it. What's going to happen this year is an even greater increase in the migration um, of refugees and economic migrants. And water finds its own level. Uh, the route through Italy may come back, in which case uh, are we going to shut the door on Schengen and Italy? Because it looks like we're going to shut the door on Schengen on Greece. And so the borders of, of fortress Europe will shift several hundred miles north. If Italy is overwhelmed, it will shift there, and there's four borders that would close. There's the Libyan across to Italy route, which is why France is so uh, involved in putting a military expedition force together at the moment. I, I do see us returning to Libya militarily this year. When you say we, who is we? The French leading five or six other countries, including the Italians and the British. The British are going to put up about a thousand troops. The French are going to put up several thousand With more. With air cover from the Americans. Yeah. yeah. Uh, leading, Mr. Obama will continue to lead from behind. Water finds its own level. And whoever succeeds him. Yes. Oh, it, it, they'll have to, but they'll lead from behind. Water finds its own level. Um, if you look at that map, for me, that water will, f if, if, if the French and Italian, sorry, the Greek and Italian routes are blocked, the water will flow to the right through the Black Sea, and your next flashpoint is Bulgaria. And people try to get round to Northern Europe that way. And when it comes to the Balkans, uh, people call us hard-hearted. Uh, they are overwhelmed and don't have the infrastructure, and I can see serious problems in, uh, in, in the Balkans. And to finish off, this is going to have massive effects on our politics. We've seen the drift to the right. That's going to continue all year and next year. Possibly a Brexit. I think it's 50-50. Um, and as the way to, to look at it is not just Fortress Europe. It's Fortress Europe and then within Fortress Europe, Fortress Nation State. Because the old nation states are re-emerging very, very quickly. Um, and that's not going to reverse, uh, that's going to continue, and the impact on that on the EU is going to be quite profound, and on all our lives, and on how you guys plan the cities that everybody's going to come to. So how we deal with that fracturing, how we deal, uh, and our nation states, and how we deal with or not absorbing, integrating, whatever word you want to use, uh, this migration, uh, really, how we meet those challenges is going to affect Europe's <coughs> prosperity. Everything about us. 
Um, and at the moment, it's sauf qui peut, each man for himself. Uh, Europe's first test in 70 years, and we're failing it, because we're not acting as one, we're acting as 28 individual decision makers. Um, and it's, it's fallen apart very, very quickly, our big challenge. This is the greatest political experiment ever in human history, 500 million of us, uh, the lowest murder rate in the world. Uh, war has been declared null and void within our space. Great prosperity. I think it's all at risk. Um, it sounds a little bit perhaps overblown, but I look at... I don't look at the last 70 years at all, I think, but I look at the last 2,000 years, and if I see a pattern of us fighting, 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 with this little, little blip of us getting on with each other, I don't see that blip as necessarily the future. Now, that's not to say we're all about to invade very, you know, Alsace-Lorraine or whatever, but there is this real problem of the nation states rising. I've already seen the, the, the Holy Roman Empire is re-emerging in the, in the Benelux and Germany. They are talking about a mini Schengen. The British out there on their own is re-emerging. The Scandinavians are re-emerging. The Visegrad group is re-emerging in, in middle Europa. All these things are coming and unless somebody sorts it, uh, the EU will potentially fail. What I'm quite confident will happen is that ever closer union will die. Uh, we may return to an EEC type thing, and Britain may not be part of that. Have a look at the British front pages today, uniformly hostile to Mr Cameron's uh, deal with Mr Tusk yesterday. The Sun leads the way with, EU, do you think you are kidding, Mr Cameron? But that's the tone of the debate <laughs> for the rest of the year. But that's what you would expect from the Sun. Let's be very clear. That's not exactly well, look anybody at the who's familiar with and the, the British Mail and the Telegraph. They're, they're You'd all expect that from the Mail. Uh, so the cha well, the challenge certainly for the United Kingdom is going to be to try to have not an emotional debate, but a debate that is based on facts. I, I think and that's no, I where disagree. business. I want an so emotional debate, please, because you want an emotional debate. one side is going to have an emotional debate of plucky little Englanders sticking together and, you know, who do you think you're kidding, Mr. Hitler? And the other side is going to bore us to death with the facts and figures that people like you will lap up and think, most of you, that makes sense. And the rest of the population won't know what you're talking about. And the rest of the population will be listening to who do you think you're kidding, Mr. Hitler? And don't forget of the emotion. Look what the Scots, the Scots nearly left, even though the economic argument was blindingly obvious. Don't underestimate emotion. And Sir Stuart Rhodes is a brilliant, brilliant guy. But, but I knew that was going to be. Yeah, he needs someone alongside him with a bit of emotion to tell yeah. us about standing together with our European friends and or any other platitude you can come out with, because there's going to be a dry economic debate which might just, just, just keep us in. But um, once you've had four months, there's already sixty thousand people have come already. You know, and, and it doesn't make any difference if you tell me it's just one percent of the entire EU population. Who's reading the stats? I'm looking at the guy that just took my job because I'm a minicab driver. You know, people have got to get back to that level and start talking to those people because at the moment, excuse me, they're only talking to you. Right. Well, we've been told. Yep. Okay. And this is coming from somebody who's worked in journalism on an international level uh, for 30 years. Um, I just want to go through your whole... You've just written, um, and I recommend... Uh, your book is Prisoners of Geography, 10 Maps That Will Tell You Everything You Need to Know About Global Politics. And um, you basically, in 10 chapters, talk about your, your experiences. Um, you've covered the Gulf War, the Balkans in the 90s, conflicts in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, and Syria. So the paint, you know, the picture that you paint is actually very gloomy, both of the United Kingdom. You said 50-50 for a Brexit. If Britain... How does it change if Britain does remain in the EU? There's a problem. The EU is damned if it does and damned if it doesn't. If they give the Brits too much, other countries will start carving off little pieces, and so the EU will change. If Britain leaves, it's just lost 15% of its GDP, and it looks, it's, it looks careless. Mm -hmm. And the, the philosophy, never underestimate you know, f philosophy driving things as well as the facts and the figures, changes. I'm not that gloomy, actually. Um, I, th I think the, the prosperity will continue. Okay, you're no. not that gloomy. <laughs> no, Boy, that, that, that's lucky. No, really. It sounded pretty gloomy. We, we will replenish. I'm glad you're laughing. <laughs> we, will we will replenish. The continent will remain strong and relatively prosperous. What troubles me 
is the, the, inf the influx of people, uh, and don't take this the wrong way, I'm not making an argument for or against it, will change our societies. The is changing. Is. Actually. The drift to the right mm -hmm. is, is, I mean, we all know our own countries, but Sweden, Hungary, uh, the Finn party in Finland, I mean, every country I can Poland. look at there, Poland, uh, who's elected, uh, yes, uh, growing. But they're more in, still in the some damage. countries they're in charge, and in some countries the real, real proper fascists are rising. Golden Dawn, 500,000 people voted Greece, for in Greece, yeah. which is a small, 11 million people. 500,000 people voted for what is, a, without any question, a fascist party. I'm not, I mean, UKIPA is, is, is right of centre and uh, nationalistic. It's not Front a fascist National party. Here in France. They are somewhere between UKIP and Marine Gold, Le Pen and looking Dawn. like she's definitely going yeah. through the first round of this the is going to change election. our societies. We are going to the right. All our politicians will then tap with them to try and draw that sting. The nation state will re-emerge, and Europe, the EU, has a problem if it doesn't hold together. Which is my last macro point. There's only, for me, there's only one way to to challenge the United States, Putin's Eurasian economic area. Um, and, and China, and that is to act as one on a trade basis, possibly a defence foreign policy, that's much more complicated, but on a trade basis. And I've looked at what's happened in Latin America, the Chinese have picked off each country one by one, because they have a pretend EU in Latin America, it's actually a web page. That's it. <laughs> they might have an office on the third floor of somewhere. The Chinese have picked them off one by one because they're unable to act as a block to do trade. The only way we can get our uh, decent um, trade going with China, <coughs> I, th I think, is, is, is as a trading block. Uh, it doesn't make me a great European, that. It just means I would care about my wallet. What about the Zika um, virus? How does that affect, um, whether it's Brazil and the Olympics or uh, investment, that kind of phenomenon? <laughs> Annie. Well, I, I'm amazed we're all here after the millennium bug destroyed the world. <laughs> and I only just got over Ebola. I don't know about you. I don't think it affects it very much at all. Thank you. OK. The big drama that is created very often by 24-hour uh, news channels. Um, and one of, the, of course, the, 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 the problems that you and I know about is this constant repetition. And it's almost as if the problem gets exponentially bigger uh, by the 15 minutes. I won't mention any channels. Um, <laughs> there we are. Let me turn to my right and to you, Michael Heiser. Uh, so as we said, you're the chief economist at Alliance. You uh, advise the board of <coughs> Allianz. Um, on economic and strategic issues. You're responsible also for an analysis and forecasts uh, of the German and the international economy and the financial markets um, and risk analysis. And so we've listened a lot to the uh, geopolitics, but of course all of that also influences so much of the investment, of the uh, confidence in markets, etc. Paint us a picture of the trend and how 2016 looks, um, and then start projecting a bit forward. What are the trends that you see now that are the, the most important, um, and then for the next, well, till the end of the year? Okay. Well, thank you. First, I'd like to say it's a pleasure to be here. It's a very impressive gathering. It already was very impressive uh, yesterday evening. I learned a lot about the uh, the, the business of real estate and architecture especially. When, when I was, I think, 22, I visited uh, the, uh, the, the building, the... Uh, Pompidou? Pompidou, sorry. Centre, yeah. <laughs> Centre yeah. Pompidou. Very, very impressed by it at that time. It was just the place to go. And uh, I learned a lot about that yesterday evening. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, I think the, we all know the year started very, very turbulent, uh, very disruptive. A uh, bad start of the year on financial markets. We had a very, very um, toxic, you would say, cocktail of risks uh, that, that hit financial markets. We had the geopolitical tensions, um, of course, in the Middle East, but then also between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Um, we had the disaccord in Europe and, and the migration flows to Europe, which were not really under control in the view of uh, of the economic uh, uh, community and the markets. Then we, of course, had China, 
which uh, was slowing down. That was not so surprising. But the fact that they loosened their um, exchange rate uh, peg to the dollar was a surprise. And everyone was thinking about maybe a, a, a forced devaluation of some kind, which would uh, massively hit other countries. We had capital outflows out of emerging markets, uh, especially out of China, last year figuring probably around 650 billion uh, US dollars. So a lot of bad news uh, hit the market. And then on top of that, the oil price declined massively, uh, usually seen as a boon for the global economy. This time, it's the big, big scare for stock markets, which I think is not logical. I'll say a few words about that. But you know, we saw the volatility on markets, and we still see it, I think, today again, that, uh, that we actually had expected, given, given the situation, given high valuations, given a lot of tension on the markets. And probably this volatility is, is going to stay um, for us as, as business people and investors. It's, it's going to stay the year out because we have asymmetries in monetary policy and the like. And all these risks are not going to just disappear very quickly. So it will be volatile. But the question is, where's the trend? And personally, I think that there will not we will have a fairly decent economic growth and, and probably also in terms of trend, a fairly decent development on stock markets and other yeah, more risky financial market segments. One main driver of the economy and in the end also of stock prices will, in my view, be the oil price, which has collapsed, which is for the huge majority of the global economy, all the majority of countries in the global economy, a big, big booster for, uh, for private consumption, it creates a lot of purchasing power in the big countries. Of course, it's a bad hit for the producers of oil, the exporters of oil. Uh, they have to scale down their, their expenditure, which they have basically uh, increased excessively in the years of high oil prices, so they will have to adjust. They are adjusting, but they will not cut their demand on world markets uh, in any way in the extent uh, of the creation of demand in, um, in the consumer strong countries of the world. So uh, overall, it's uh, for demand, it's um, a net positive effect. And uh, I always like to point also to the supply side effect of this fall in oil and commodity prices, which was analyzed by American economists after the big oil price hikes very intensively. It's, a, it's an input factor into production. And the production costs go down. Uh, if oil inputs become a lot cheaper, uh, then over time your, your uh, sales prices may come down or the profit margins of companies may improve. So it also has an impact on the su supply side of the economy. And therefore, I think it's going um, to be uh, a boost to the economy. Um, we think the industrialized world is going to grow at a decent rate. Uh, the US may be a little below 2.5%. Uh, the Eurozone will probably pick up to, uh, we think, 1.8% or 1.9% this year. Germany, also given the migration flows, uh, will probably be above 2% this, uh, this year. So uh, we're not by far as pessimistic as the markets seem to be right now. So what are the major obstacles you see coming down the track post-2016? Well, we, we do have a lot of political risks, and that's you know, pretty intriguing for us economists to you know, make forecasts or scenarios, not really knowing how these political risks are going to play out. What's going to happen in Syria? Is, is the peace Would you talk? say it's an, sorry uh, to interrupt, so, but would yeah, you sure. say that this is a, you, you referred to the fact that it was a toxic mix. Would you say that this is, and often that the word is overused, but uh, an unprecedented mixture which increases the volatility and the instability of both confidence and therefore of markets? Yes, I, I think so. I mean, we've had times of big, big uncertainties in the past as well, so it's not unique maybe. What, what is, I think, unique is the unpredictability of many of these processes. There's not much optimism that Syria you know, will find peace soon. Um, there's a question mark what's happening in Turkey. There is a question mark whether the Ukraine-Russian conflict will remain somehow subdued. Um, there's a question mark how Europe will come out of this uh, uh, disarray, if you like, or this, this disaccord in, 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 in policy, um, whether we'll, we, we will find a joint answer to the, to the migration and so on. So a lot of uncertainties, which are hard to forecast. 
but uh, actually impact the economic development. And, and, and this uncertainty itself, I think, is, is a burden to, to financial markets. So do you think, um, is your best prediction that that is likely to continue? Uh, or, or you think that you know, people are being overly gloomy? And what is the impact that that's going to have in investment um, and in real estate? Well, what we basically assume that the status quo will, will remain as it, as it is and uh, that we don't see a worst case or a sudden improvement of some of these crises. I think that, that is hard to, you know, uh, to uh, justify. So we say it, it'll, it'll remain the way it is, basically. And um, yeah, that is, uh, that is the assumption. Uh, and under this assumption, the economic developments will, will prevail. And, and will run the way um, um, I've, I've said. The problem in, in Europe, uh, to maybe come back to some of the points that have been made, um, I, th I think the EU is not going to fall apart. Uh, I think we will see action, but uh, as so often... Did you often, say see action? Action, yeah. What do you mean by that? What does that well, mean? Well, we will see an escalation of the inflow of uh, asylum seekers, um, uh, into Europe and things will escalate. Uh, mm -hmm. Schengen area may be, um, uh, may be how do you say, uh, ab abolished, uh, abolished, diminished, yeah. and, and uh, things may escalate, for example, in Greece, uh, as some foreign uh, secretaries have already said. And then there will be an escalation and some, some uh, action of the European community to, uh, well, I don't know exactly, but to safeguard the, the, the external borders, to maybe uh, come to a, a common um, uh, a quota compromise regulation, a compromise uh, mm -hmm. where, where the refugees can, can in an orderly process uh, find safety. And I think these things will happen. Uh, the poli policymakers are not going to let uh, the EU fall apart because of this migration. It's too big to fail. It is. Yeah. We've heard that before. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Tim, do you want to pick up on that? Well, I, I agree with almost all of it, um, just not necessarily the end bit. I wish I had confidence in our, in our leaders. I think they are still stuck in their ideological um, prison, which I really respect of building an ever closer union. They're stuck in it, and the, the, the populations have left them behind years ago. They think they're ahead of the populations. It's the other way around. The populations are ahead of them. And they just don't, they don't get it, and they, they have no concept of it. And I, I, this, this So this is feeding into a cynicism yes. and, a, and a mistrust. Um, and this is why we hear, not just in the United Kingdom, but there is, yeah. in fact, very often in the UK, they don't realize that in France, in Spain, and other European countries, there is dissatisfaction with Huge. what is called Brussels. Huge. M most people loathe it. Um, I went for a walk this morning, and just a few blocks round, and I passed several people sleeping rough in this great, incredibly rich area of the capital of one of the great countries of the world. And then up um, near the Elysee, a, a squadron of soldiers, fully armed in full combat gear, with one had a machine gun, three had assault rifles. We're in a state of emergency. That's my point. And I'm reminded that history does not stop. There, was, there is no end of history. There is no, I think the French call it finite politique. There is no end of politics. And then... Um, finalité, I think. Finalité, thank mm -hmm. you. We mentioned Boulevard Haussmann. The reason that there is a Boulevard Haussmann is because after the Paris Commune, these very small, tiny little roads were demolished because there was too much insurrection going on. That's why there is, because... And, you know, I might sound like, um, you know, as if I think World War Three is about to arrive. I don't. I just... When you look at history, it is not inevitable that we progress, and that's why we have to be always on guard. And I, you can see the violence that we've had. And Michael talked about the, the bottling up that's going to happen. I can foresee this year a refugee camp with 250,000 people in it, in Greece, and then another 50,000 in refugee tents in Macedonia. And then the rioting begins, and then people push through violently. And then what do we do with our European liberal values? Because they will go to the wall. They may have to go to the wall, many of them. They already have gone to the wall, some of them. I mean, the Danish vote to take your valuables off you when you arrive. Now, if, I, if, if my mother wants to go into a care home, bless her, 
uh, she, my country will take enough money from her until a certain point, and then the state will pay. So, I mean, I'm not necessarily decrying the Danish vote, but the point is we are taking valuables away from desperate people arriving on our borders. Where are our European values? And they will continue to be chipped away at. That's my biggest fear. It's, my biggest fear is not immigration. <coughs> it's the rate at which it comes and our liberal values, which are not that much to do with economics, I accept. But there, we are going to see some real, real trouble this year, much worse than last so year. So social uh, trouble. Social trouble, especially in the Balkans, and also social trouble on our streets, and a continuing drift to the right. Uh, that, that is not going to stop. When you say on our streets, so you mean in, in European countries? Yeah. Look at the rights you, you've had here in Paris. Look at the rights we've had in the UK. The, it's a volatile time, extremely volatile time. We got used to thinking of where we were as if it was going to continue forever. It isn't. Journalists are always, are always saying, you know, oh, this is a crossroads, or it's a this, or it's a that, because it helps the story. And my personal phrase whenever I covered a US election was to say, this is the most important US election since the last one. <laughs> Because that is the reality. It is the most important one since the last one. It's not the most important one in the world. I mean, Hillary Clinton was talking about, you know, this is the most important. It's not. It's important for her. <laughs> but, but with that caveat, and I Bill. really do yeah. believe that at the moment this really is a, 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 a changing time when there's volatility. We really find it hard to predict. You asked me in 1965. Well, I wasn't. Oh, I was only six. You know, but even then, I was precocious and could have given you. <laughs> of course, a, you were. Could have given you, you a, a timeline. <laughs> no, the, 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 you could say things with a lot of confidence. You can't say things with as much confidence at the moment because it's such in a state of flux. As I think it was the uh, Her Majesty the Queen, the longest uh, head of state in the world. Um, by the way, I, I recommend you Google her two only speeches to the UN. And admirable lady, is she on her thirteenth Prime Minister? Yeah. Yeah, um, that is quite a feat of and incredible uh, knowledge there. And that film, The Queen with Helen Mirren, ain't bad at picturing it. But she turned very quietly. For those of you who don't know, the Queen uh, is not supposed to give you uh, her personal opinion. We're not supposed to know which way she wants. Uh, for example, she wanted the Scottish to vote. She did actually subtly let us know. She wanted Scotland to stay within the United Kingdom. And indeed, Her Majesty's pleasure was uh, safe because it, but, but, because it was. But she did suggest to somebody, you know, did you predict the uh, banking crisis? Uh, um, <laughs> you know, um, and uh, the fact is that nobody <coughs> did. You might like to know, Greg, by the way, that at some point somebody's mobile phone went off and she looked at the person, she said, uh, you might need to get that it might be somebody important. <laughs> <laughs> Which I have to say, uh, the British part of me just loves that British sense of humour. So um, we're moving from riots, um, and um, I'm trying to keep the mood up here, goodness gracious. Um, although we journalists are fantastic at, uh, you know, there was a survey done about when you watch a news bulletin, I'm not going to do my own profession any good. Um, I don't know if you saw this. And um, let's say that your mood is at zero, right? just you know, flatlining something. Sort of you actually go into depression. It takes you 20 minutes to recover from any of our bulletins. That's not a very good um, a promotion of my profession, is it? Um, one of the things we don't do very successfully in our profession, often on 24-hour news channels, is revisit subjects. And I think that's something that I think needs to be done. And I think that's sometimes when there's a disconnect. And it doesn't help. It doesn't help you. Um, and there is a tendency sometimes because of that, I think, to, to dramatise things. But there is European recovery, Michael, um, isn't there? But the problem is that it doesn't necessarily lead to job creation. We've seen that in the United States. Yeah, well, um, usually the economists are in charge of depression. Uh, yes. Our science is called a dismal science because we always look uh, towards the problems that uh, the uh, the roadblocks for growth and so on. Um, so uh, it's not only the journalists, uh, but presently I hope I can I can inject a little dose of optimism in uh, in a fairly bleak picture overall. I think, as I already said, the the European economy uh, is uh, recovering. Um, this is more a short run phenomenon, but it's it's very important in the present situation, where we have uh, strong political headwinds and the population is getting more and more uh, European critical, Euro critical, EU critical, as you, as you wish. In this situation, it is of course very important, we get a little bit of tailwind yep. by the economic situation. 
And I think this is taking place. There's, there's three factors at work, basically, in Europe. It's, uh, it's oil, as I already said, uh, creating flat prices, price stability. That means your nominal wage increases are purchasing power, uh, real wage increases. That's boosting consumption in France, in Germany, basically all over. That's number one. Number two is the euro, which is pretty weak, which is helping, of course, the exporters to, to increase a little bit their market share on global markets. And despite having low growth uh, globally and, and low trade, exports are going all right. Uh, in most European countries. In some, they're quite strong, basically, in, in Spain, for example, um, but uh, quite a few peripheral countries, Ireland, huge export. So um, this, this is the, the second factor. And the third factor is basically reform. Some of the peripheral countries have embarked on a process of reform a couple of years ago and are bearing the fruit in terms of um, more efficiency in their economies, better uh, competitiveness, job growth, the Which job. countries are you thinking of then? Well, the, what we call the former program countries, uh, ex-Greece, I would say. Greece is a special case because mm. of the political upheavals and so on. But the, uh, the, the ex-program uh, countries, I like to call them the reform countries. Um, that's uh, basically Spain, uh, Portugal, where we, of course, now have a, a, a left uh, a government coalition. Uh, also, Spain is a, is a move to the left, not, not really to the right. Um, but they have done a lot to improve the economies, as have the Irish, of course. This is not only reforms, it's also market adjustments. Wages uh, go down, uh, spending goes down, uh, debt is, is reduced, uh, private debt, and these things uh, take place, and then the economies are on a solid footing again and start to grow. Uh, Ireland, I don't know, 5%. Uh, Spain over 3%, et cetera, et cetera. This is part of it, but now, in the meantime, also the big uh, players, uh, France and Italy, have slowly but surely moved on a course of reform. I think if you add up what happened in Italy over the last four years, it's actually quite impressive. A lot in Italy of reform uh, endeavors is, it gets stuck in the parliament and in the, you know, in the public uh, bureaucracy, and so we, we know that. But even what comes out at the bottom is still quite impressive. And now France has also slowly but surely changed course and is, is going for some reforms, is going for some tax uh, uh, advantages for companies that create jobs, is going for a, a jobs act, is uh, uh, trying to streamline the public uh, administration in France and that's a um, very tall uh, order. Lo lo yeah. Lots of things. It, it's Many difficult, presidents but, have come uh, a cropper on that one. Yeah, French <laughs> presidents. <laughs> but you know, I think this is the third factor: reforms, which is very important in the long run, and it, and it's working. So I think we will we will have growth. Uh, France is going all right, by the way. The, uh, the GDP numbers are, are not going to be bad uh, this year. So um, we we have some growth, and that's of course important for for confidence, for the sentiment, and maybe it'll take a little bit of wind out of the sails of the real populists that are trying to renationalize Europe. I don't think they will uh, succeed with that. And um, uh, hopefully we will get this back one, this tailwind. Okay, I'm conscious of time. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to go to a Q&A. There should be two people in the room with roving mics. Thank you very much. Sir, could you tell us, would you mind standing up? Then everybody can see you. Tell us who you are, who your question is addressed to. Hi, everyone. Yes, yes, but just I, in case everybody doesn't know, it gives them, you know, it's good visibility. Um, my <laughs> name is Roger Rorf with Apollo, and I'd like to ask the panel, do you think Europe should distinguish between asylum seekers and economic migrants? Right in there. Tim. 100%. Absolutely. Thank you. We've got to manage it. We've got to, we need people, but we need to manage it. Uh, we need to choose. We also have the obligation to help. And we do not have the obligation to help uh, hundreds of thousands of economic migrants. But we do have an obligation to help genuine asylum seekers. And um, that does get lost. And I'm afraid our European liberal values, I think, have to be put to one side when it comes to the migrants. And again, that will seem like a move to the right. Um, but that's where we're going to be heading. We're going to chip away at various things. It, it, it's, it's over this um, cuddly Europe. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I would agree as well, if I may add. Uh, yeah, for the do. German case, uh, this is a, a very crucial. Uh, we see that uh, 
um, um, economic migrants are using the asylum uh, laws and rights. Uh, it's the only chance they have to uh, enter Germany and to maybe find a job and some kind of existence. And there is no other way for them, um, <coughs> basically, unless they, they get a job and then can prove they have a job, then they can come as economic migrants. But people that don't have a job, that are looking for a job, they have to use the asylum rights. And that is, of course, uh, the, the wrong thing to do, basically. It takes uh, uh, one and a half years to have from, from, the, from the application until the the final decision uh, is the right uh, granted or is it not granted and uh, in the meantime it's difficult to find work for them and it's uh, uh, the, the, the quota of those that are sent back in the end is very very low in Germany so most of these people will say okay well you know give, give an experience that, that'll get me you know at least a couple of years to stay uh, even if I'm not granted the right and, and this process is, is the wrong one for economic migrants we should have a different, a different uh, set of rules and laws, but it's it's presently it's politically difficult to set that on top of the asylum rights because that mean you 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 open maybe another uh, window of, of, of migration, uh, of economic migration. Um, so it's 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 not an issue right now, but it you may have be seen good. Spartacus, yes. uh, the film Spartacus. I, I've been down south. Uh, I speak a little bit of Arabic, and I can tell the accents. And I know when I hear, I'm Syrian, I'm Syrian, I'm Syrian, I'm thinking, you've got a North African accent. No, you're not. Well, we know that some people are being coached yeah. um, as to what to say and conveniently lose their passports. As far as um, asylum seekers are concerned, I know that the rate of acceptance in France is actually quite low. And I read an interesting article yesterday on the Eurostar, uh, I think it was Le Figaro, Le Monde, where there were Eritrean asylum seekers who were actually be trying to be processed. Um, and it was found that some of the translators are conveniently missing out a paragraph or two, were actually crucial paragraphs that would have actually possibly made that application successful. Um, and then suddenly these translators appear to work for and attend functions at the Eritrean embassy. So there are issues, um, certainly. Lady in the front row. Uh, Dr. Karen Siraki, Caspar Associates. Do you think we've had too much QE? Oh. <laughs> 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 um, the, well, that, that's, that's a nice question. I, today I have a little piece in the Wall Street Journal uh, which addresses the issue of how QE has hurt the European saver. And um, uh, this, this article was initiated by a speech by Mario Draghi uh, a couple of days ago where he argued uh, that this is not true, that QE has uh, helped the uh, economy recover, not only QE, but the expansionary uh, monetary policy of the last couple of years actually has improved uh, growth, employment, and so on, and therefore is good for the saver. And I, I try to take a diff different position. I don't think QE has done a lot to uh, stabilize the economies. Um, it, uh, there's a completely different uh, explanation. I, 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 I gave it basically in my little presentation here. It, it was uh, oil, it was uh, the euro, which has a little bit to do with monetary policies, but it was also reforms and, and macro adjustments that just take place in the economies that made them recover. It wasn't QE. The banks have not been illiquid. There has been abundant liquidity for, for years and years, and that's not the reason why they have not really given out loans freely. Um, they, they have been called to reduce their risks, also by the ECB and other regulators, so um, uh, they, they were uh, risk adverse, and the companies didn't really take up much uh, loans because the economy was in such a bad state. So um, uh, this now the economy is better, and we see lending coming up again. It doesn't have to do with QE. So the saver is bearing, is getting a hit, uh, especially as I wrote in a little article in terms of pension funds and life insurance, where the the returns are going to be low for long, and that is a real big hit for savers, and that is creating even more savings right now, other than the QE proponents would like. It's not creating consumption, it's creating more savings because the savers are getting a hit. So sorry, it was a long answer, but the, the, the question was right on spot for me, thanks. <laughs> and here it is, the how the ECB hurts Europe's savers um, by a certain Michael Heiser. Thank you so much for sparing the time to be with us today. <laughs>
And the byline is quantitative easing is fine if you're wealthy with a diversified portfolio. <laughs> for others, not so much. Anyway, recommended it's good reading. For stocks, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. There was uh, yes, the gentleman in the second row. Yeah, it's Stefan Doyle from Munich and also Washington DC. Um, you digged into the the oil issue, and my straight question is: When is Saudi Arabia turning the corner, or in otherwise, in other words? Uh, when are the Arabian world stabilizing the region? Well, maybe you can also address that. And, um, uh, not this year. Um, because this is where politics comes into economics and the Iran-Saudi standoff. I'm confident the oil price will remain at least below 40. The Iranians have got 500 billion, uh, million uh, barrels which they're now able to sell. And I know it's only $30 a barrel, but they need that money desperately. So they will sell it, and that, that means there's even more of a glut. The Saudis are not going, be, because of their rivalry with Iran, they are not going to start pumping masses. Of, so I think, you know, let's make hay for the next year at least, and screw Russia. That's a technical political term. Apologies for anybody who's offended by swearing. <laughs> Did you want to add something? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I, I, uh, basically I would agree. I think the, the, the conflict with Iran was an argument to, to even prolong the uh, huge supply that Saudi Arabia is, is putting on the market. Um, compared with former cycles where the oil price went down, they've been waiting and waiting and waiting such a long time. In former uh, downward cycles, they reacted much more quickly. Um, so we've been waiting for this reaction. I think it, it, it will probably turn up uh, this year. Um, uh, I think the damage has been done to the competitors uh, in uh, unconventional uh, energy um, uh, production, oil, uh, shale, and tar sands, and so on, and also in conventional, where uh, you know very expensive exploitation projects uh, were planned. They've all been shelved. Um, there are some people who try to calculate that. It's, uh, I think the number is at around 360 billion investment uh, wow. dollars that are, uh, have been uh, stopped. So that is going to reduce supply over the long run, and that's what the Saudis wanted. So I think they've have accomplished in a way what they wanted. And now, just by communicating that the supply may become a little bit tighter, I think they would have a chance of moving up the price. And, and they, and they would need that, given their uh, fiscal situation. Thanks. Let's go to the gentleman over there. And keep on putting your hands up. I'd like some people. Right, you, sir, will be the next one. Yeah. Adel Korget, that's from Hamburg. If Schengen fails, will the euro currency fail too? If what fails, sorry? If Schengen uh, oh, yeah. fails, will the euro currency fail too? Thank you, Michael. <laughs> uh, my, my quick answer is, is no. Uh, of course, Schengen is important uh, economically uh, as well, but it's 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 more a political project. It's uh, it's one of those agreements that safeguards values. Uh, the, the freedom to move and to travel uh, is a very basic value, I think, in the in the European uh, region, and and that's what Schengen safeguards. And it's it's not uh, um, you know the the primary economic uh, issue. We, we, we definitely want Schengen to stay for, for reasons of trade and cost from moving from one border to the other, but I don't think it will have this repercussion. And very briefly, picking up on that, um, if the UK does indeed the uh, voters go whenever the referendum is, whether it's the 23rd of June, the 29th of June, or, um, or next year, since David Cameron's got till the end of 2017 to hold that referendum, if there is a Brexit, how will that affect the Eurozone and the Euro? I think it's a, it's a big shock. Um, I agree with what Tim said on that. Um, it's a big shock. It's a, a, a political, a loss of political power and uh, clout for the, for the European Union. the financial Union. investment knock-on effect that well, you predict? Well, I don't think that would be so detrimental to continental Europe. Uh, I would be more worried about the disadvantages for the UK. Um, we already see uh, capital investors uh, going slowly, and uh, I think that would uh, that would also happen if uh, the uh, uh, Great Britain was not in the EU anymore. So um, uh, I think uh, it's 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 it wouldn't be good for, for also for the financial industry uh, in yeah. London. 
So um, I think I hope that in the end there will be a, a positive vote, <laughs> not least because of the Scottish. <laughs> Uh, I yes. agree, I don't think it will necessarily kill the euro, but it will give a, a very good excuse to people like Poland not to join. Uh, and again, don't underestimate philosophy and, and intellectual trends and moves and gut feelings. And if there's a blow like that, other people in the periphery think, I'm not joining that. So it, Turkey. Well, Turkey's going to be very successful this next 10 years, but that's another matter. Oh, well, that's a tip. Yeah. That's a hot tip. Uh, someone... Over there, yes. You, Hi, sir. Ross McDermott with uh, Bruton Capital. Who is going to pay for the electoral promises of the dead Italian politicians? Somebody slept well last night. We are. <laughs> 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 okay, that's a, that's a good one. I mean, the, uh, the present discussion is, is pretty uh, uncomforting that uh, M Matteo Renzi is once again uh, trying to undermine the, uh, the growth and stability pact and uh, trying to get more flexibility into the system. Um, uh, if a country that didn't have the problems of Italy would have this request, I would be much more open because we can debate whether such rules are really, you know, really the, the optimum of economic policy uh, management. Uh, I, the, you can discuss that. But a country like Italy, you know, should be going down that route because they are hugely dependent on the support of the, of the ECB. Uh, under Italian uh, leadership to, to keep the rates of uh, interest low in Italy so the, the, the borrowing of the government on fin uh, financial market works at a very, very low risk spread that Italy has. So in this situation, announcing that maybe a little more spending would be uh, something sensible is to me a very risky strategy. Italy with its 120% uh, debt to GDP ratio should be trying to do anything else. I mean, they, they came into this turmoil and a couple of years of recession because they had no room of maneuver in fiscal policies. When they were cut off the markets, they just had to you know, cut down spending without any real choices. So the, the debt got them into this situation and now discussing that maybe one should be a little bit more flexible on debt issues is completely the wrong way and, uh, but I don't, I don't think that the, the European uh, Monetary Union will, will buy this. <laughs> Literally. Um, right, so um, the gentleman here and then the gentleman over there. Good morning. John Banker from Warsaw. Um, there seems to be a trade pact, I believe, negotiated between uh, the US and the EU. Well, although we haven't heard too much about it lately, maybe because it's been crowded out by, by other news. Um, can you comment on its progress and potential impact on the EU economy? Do you take Michael? Oh, uh, I can't say very much about the progress. I think it's, it's very slow. I, I, I'm not an insider and it's, it is still fairly intransparent, which is maybe the nature of such uh, international negotiations. I think the progress is very slow. That's what we hear from people closer by. Uh, there will be some kind of uh, a result of TTIP. Uh, but it will be like a minimum consensus. It probably won't be very impressive. And uh, I think it's a chance gone by in a way, because if we had created something like a, a real common market, um, like we are creating in Europe between the US and, and the Eurozone, this, this would you know, create competition, create innovation. Uh, and it would, of course, be a different political power in international standard setting in, in shaping the world order that is really changing fast. So it, it's a great chance, and I, I don't think it will really be taken. You're in favor of it. I'm in favor of it. Thank Jim, you. Any comments? Thank you for the question. Thank I you for the answer. I can't better that. Um, right. Um, the gentleman with the microphone at the moment. And Thank then you. the last question, I'm afraid, will have to go to that gentleman there. Yes, sir. Yep, the Boer of uh, Masterdam. I'm going to say something which probably nobody wants to hear, but I was looking at uh, one of the earlier charts and you saw this, this great chart of Europe staying flat and Africa moving to uh, 3 billion, 5 billion, whatever population. And I was thinking, come on, we're the Urban Land Institute. We should be fascinated by that population growth and the opportunities that that represents. And all we're doing is uh, looking uh, like a rabbit in the headlights, uh, concentrating at whatever is in front of us for the next six months. And I've he been hearing doomsday scenarios for the past five years about Europe falling apart and Spain falling apart. But nobody seems to 
pick up the, the big opportunity, which is three billion people needing new houses, new cities, new urban development, and um, it's 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 one of the one of the themes which seems to have disappeared completely over the past five years. But it is something that uh, we have an obligation to to uh, also think about. That is a great great need. I completely agree Thank with you. all that. Um, I mean, we, politics does tend to be fairly short in its <laughs> concentration. Um, and, and yeah, okay, if we bring it back to, to you guys, the decisions you make and also how you influence the politicians are going to be very important. And there are some big decisions to make because we are going to have an extra two, three hundred million people over the next 30, 40 years from other parts of the world. And I, I look at a place called Eastley in Nairobi, which is known as Little Mogadishu. Uh, because there's a positive and a negative in Little Mogadishu. The uh, Somalian that now live there alongside Eritreans and others have made a really amazing, vibrant, um, fairly large city within a city. Uh, it's got all sorts of transactions going on. And it's actually a mo it's that model. But the housing, all the rest of it, and, and the infrastructure is not doing too well. And so there's a lot of tensions. And also there's a lot of Islamist um, or verging towards terrorism coming out of there. And so Eastley in Nairobi, for me, is a really good example of the positives and the negatives of, of what are going on. And we will have our own Eastleys in all, well, we already do to an extent in all of our cities. So yeah, I hope you make the right decisions. Thank you for that. Very last question. I'm afraid it needs to be very brief. Uh, Thomas Sefcik, Artesian in Hong Kong. Uh, like your, your Great conversation, though. fantastic. The only trouble I have, 2015, similar panel, no mention about migrant crisis, you know, of the outlook of, 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 of the 2015. So, to keep it mit, uh, with Mitt Romney, what are your unknowns unknowns for 2016? <laughs> because the migrant crisis was not on our agenda last year. Nobody had it on their watch. So, what are your favorite unknowns unknowns? Excellent question. Thank you for posing it. Like your style, here's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Tim. Well, it's also it's the wrapping up, isn't it? It, 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 it is indeed. Uh, I planned it all yeah, along, scripted biotic. it, everything. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, what happened is that the, the, from really 2014, I'm surprised nobody mentioned it last year. The migrant crisis uh, magnified the crash of 2008 and all the problems that we've had because there wasn't enough money to take care of the problem. Now, the 2008 crash problem will go away through boom and bust. The migrant crisis is not going to go away. Um, so, if I round up. Most civil wars last, on average, 13 years. Um, Syria is in year six. I see no end to it this year at all. Uh, therefore, the, all that's going to continue. Um, Russia, uh, I think, will keep Ukraine conflict frozen. Very, very handy to have a frozen conflict that you can turn the heat up and down whenever you want. And at the moment, they very cleverly leveraged the U the Ukraine crisis into the Syrian crisis because they're now, and I saw this coming last summer, when they went to Syria, the deal is, we're going to take control of this and you're going to have to come to us for help. Now let's talk about those sanctions, and I think the sanctions against Russia will eventually fall. Um, I think one thing to watch for is them prodding in the Baltic states and how we react to that. Um, that, that, that will be more serious than Ukraine because it's a NATO member. And one of the really interesting trends is the amount of American uh, military hardware that's going to be pushed into Eastern Europe. There are various treaties saying that you can't have this amount of stuff, uh, this amount of troops. Now, moving kit is hard. Moving people is quite easy. So if you move all the kit and preposition it, as it's called, and it's now, oh, the Americans are pouring military stuff into Romania and, and Poland, and uh, that's really one to watch because that's going to be very tense between Russia and America. Um, the Black Sea is a very interesting part of the world now because they took uh, Crimea and, and Sebastopol. To get out of the Black Sea, you have to go through the Bosphorus, which is why Turkey will be wedded into NATO. Uh, they're not going to let that slide, even if they can't come into the European Union. There's a treaty of um, Montreux in 1933 that Turkey has to, uh, the Russians have to ask Romania if they, how many warships they can sail out, which is why the Americans will fund the Romanian So your final Navy. thought is? Ah! <laughs> well, how long have you got? My final thought is now. things are absolutely fine. America is not uh, <coughs> declining. America will continue to be the most powerful country, and Manchester City will probably win the Premiership. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Michael, your final thought? 
well, and answer I can, I can to the only, unknown unknowns. Yeah, well, I can't really talk about the unknown unknowns. That would be a very short answer because I have no idea. We will have surprises. Uh, I can talk a little bit about or just list the known unknowns that we're facing. Let's and, start with that. And uh, that, is, that is, of course, migration. Um, we don't know how this is going to develop. Uh, that is also in the economic area, it's, it's debt. We, we've seen uh, an accumulation of debt in some emerging markets, especially in the non-financial corporate debt has been rising massively in countries like, for example, China. And the, the big unknown is how they will manage that. I, I, pres I think they have the instruments to manage and they will manage it down. So um, uh, uh, we, we see risks, but overall a fairly positive development. If I may add one last thought, Do. which we haven't addressed really the, the uh, investment, real estate uh, investment, the land development, city development, so on. So I, I would like to leave you, because you're very influential as a group, with, with the thought that we, I think we should try to achieve the use of more savers capital, of more private capital for the development of uh, cities, our urban regions, our infrastructure. This I say from a German perspective where this hits very many roadblocks. Private capital, no, 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 we don't want that. Um, and uh, this is, this is a, a terrible uh, way of thinking because we see that our communities, our uh, local authorities, the cities, the states, they don't have the money uh, to, to fix the potholes in the street, to exaggerate a little bit, uh, not to speak of you know, really developing an urban uh, infrastructure that is climate friendly and um, uh, gives you a, a good uh, environment and cultural diversity and so on. So there's no money to do that and, and we as an insurance company of course are looking for long-term investments. Uh, our, uh, our clients put their money up for 20 years sometimes and we're looking for returns in the zero rate environment that, that uh, at least you know, give a little return, but also do good in terms of the development uh, of climate friendly and, and socially um, acceptable uh, infrastructure. So I wanted to leave you with that thought. Maybe all of you can do a little to push it that direction. <laughs> and the thought that actually I was reading your reports, uh, that this is all evolving and what is expected of you and more the sort of service aspect um, of your work. If you want to know more of the unknown unknowns, keep reading Michael Heise in the Wall Street Journal. If you were to speak to him later on, not that I'm telling you what to do, you might be able to sometimes call him up and get some hot tips. And as for this gentleman, you'll see him on worldwide screens. And remind us what your blog and your website is called. That's very kind of you. It's called the what and the why .com. And your book was entitled... That's very again? kind of you. <laughs> prisoners of Geography, I, I commend it to you. There we are. Uh, I hope you have not been our prisoners. I hope we've helped you with some insights. I wish you a fantastic conference. Please enjoy Paris. Uh, it's an incredible city. And um, as Francois said, and I get quite moved in saying that, thank you very much for being here. It means a lot to this city and a lot to the people of the city. Et vive la liberté and a long live freedom to speak our minds, to build responsibly, uh, to live sustainably. Uh, and thank you very much indeed for your attention this morning.